before. All right, I'm gonna start admitting folks. All right. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Aquatic Health and Biodiversity of Central Appalachian Forests webinar. Um, we're gonna get started here in a couple minutes. As folks are rolling in, um, we are in the Zoom meeting format. So if you can please keep your microphone on mute so we can have full attention on our speakers, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and we'll get started here in a couple minutes. Again, hey everyone, thanks for folks who are just now joining us. We're gonna get started here in a couple minutes. Um, it is 12.30 right now and a few folks are still rolling in. But before we get started, I did wanna say a couple housekeeping things. I know we're all really familiar with Zoom these days, but I, there's sometimes still problems. <laughs> and so I will ask, if y'all would please keep your microphones on mute for the duration of today's webinar, just to give our speakers their full attention and complete floor for them to talk about what they're gonna talk about today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the Guild's YouTube channel, hopefully by the end of the week, if not next. And this webinar is also pre-approved for one and a half CFEs with SAF. And in order to get those, I have all of y'all's information and I can just upload that to SAF. But we do ask that you are in attendance for at least 75% of today. But there's nothing else that y'all need to do except listen in and be attentive and give your hosts, well, give your speakers um, your full attention. And I think with that, that's all I needed to talk about today. Before I hand it off to our first speaker, uh, Stephen Price uh, with University of Kentucky, is going to talk about biodiversity of aquatic systems in central Appalachia. So with that, Stephen, I hand it off to you. All right. Thanks, Dakota. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Good. Okay. So I'm excited to talk to you today about biodiversity of aquatic systems in central Appalachia. A lot of my research at University of Kentucky focuses um, on freshwater ecology and uh, management and conservation in these systems. So before we start talking um, about these systems, hopefully um, you'll get out of my presentation today, you'll be able to define some aquatic systems in central Appalachia, describe major taxa, and I'm gonna be focusing mostly on animal groups um, because that's where my expertise lies and aspects of their natural history. Um, I hope you have an understanding of the biodiversity patterns that we see in Appalachia and how it compares to um, other regions. And then finally, I wanna highlight how some of these eco ecological interactions among these taxa lead to high levels of biodiversity. So when we think about aquatic systems, there's really kind of two types. Okay, there's these lentic systems, which are lakes and wetlands, and that term lentic means slow or motionless. And obviously wetlands are present in Appalachia and important for a number of species, but I really want to focus today on these lodic systems, these rivers and streams, and lodic means washing or running, because these lodic systems have some of the highest levels of biodiversity out of anywhere in, 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 in the temperate uh, world. So how do we classify lodic systems? So streams and rivers, they exhibit this unique, we call it dendritic pattern as they weave their way through the landscape. And we can use this dendritic pattern to characterize streams according to their order. So small streams that include headwaters and these streams generally that you can kind of jump over in the, in the forest, we give them an order number one, or we call them first order streams. Now, two first order streams kind of meet and they form second order streams. And then second order streams meet to form 
form third order streams and so on and so forth. So we can give a stream an order based on where it lies within that network. And we can also think about streams in terms of their watershed size. So in this image that I have below on the slide, this is an entire watershed, including first, second, third, and fourth order streams. But we could also look at just a small section of this larger watershed. And this could also be considered a watershed too, that could include just first order streams or first and second order streams, okay? So we can, base, we can define them based on watershed size. Oftentimes we define lodic systems, streams and rivers based on like the surrounding land use. So you might hear people say like, there's a stream with forest within the watershed or urban land within the watershed or agricultural land within the watershed. So we can define them based on land use as well. And we can also define them based on a term called hydro period. And this is just a, like the extent that water is on the surface within these streams. So a lot of times these first order streams or low order streams might have water flowing, you know, in the winter months, the spring, early summer. But then as summer progresses, there might not be a lot of flowing water in these systems. There might just be isolated pools. OK, we see that a lot in these lower order streams. In the higher order streams, they usually have water flowing on the surface year round. Now, one thing that's important to mention, and this will, will relate this to biodiversity here in a minute, is that there's a lot of low, low order streams um, in landscapes. And in fact, they're more numerous than high order streams. That's what this graph is showing here, just the number. So you have a lot more low order streams than higher order streams. And if you were to measure each low order stream, within a drainage area or watershed or across central Appalachia, they would, be, they would have a greater length than these higher order streams. So there's lots of these low order streams in the environment. Now, one final way we can look at these systems that if you look at a section of a stream or if you go outside your house and look at a river or a stream, you'll notice that some sections are moving like really fast and other sections are moving really slow. And the fast moving section is, of the streams are called either riffles, if it's kind of the water is rough and usually there's lots of rocks there and stuff, or they move really smoothly and we call these runs. And then the slow moving section of the streams are called pools, okay? And generally they're a little bit deeper. And like I said, the water moves slower. Now, why is all this stuff important? Because bio biodiversity varies with not only stream order, there's some species that are only found in first order streams and some species that are only found in, in fourth order streams, but it also varies according to these, these channel units. There's some species of fish that really like to be in riffles, but are never in pools. So now let's talk about some of the biodiversity that we see in central Appalachia. And I'm gonna first start talking about low order streams. Remember these streams that you can jump across in the woods and, um, the dominant group in these low order streams are the macro invertebrates. So these are insects, but also include other groups, basically any invertebrate that you can kind of see with the naked eye. And there's lots of species. I don't even try to estimate the number of species found in central Appalachia because entomologists, those that study um, insects, oftentimes just refer to species as their genus name or their family name. They don't actually refer to the full species name, but there's a lot of species. A study done in central Appalachian streams found 86 different types of insect uh, genera from more than 47 families. And they can reach really high abundances in low order streams. Sometimes there's been estimates of over 10,000 individual macroinvertebrates per meter square in some of these streams. So really abundant. The major groups that some of you may be familiar with are the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. And these animals all exhibit a biphasic life cycle. That means that for part of their life, and sometimes this is a couple of weeks or a few months or longer, they're this larval form that lives in the stream. You'll find them like underneath rocks or underneath logs in the stream. These animals then go through metamorphosis into the adult form, which is free flying and will leave the stream. Now as adults, they don't eat. Their main job in life is to basically disperse and reproduce and they die usually within a couple of days. 
Within the streams, these larvae of macroinvertebrates play a lot of important roles. A lot of things eat them, okay? So they're food for a wide variety of different animals. Another important role is they break down organic matter like leaves and woody debris and things like that and allow these nutrients to be released into the stream. Um, a lot of researchers use macroinvertebrate communities, like the number of different species and how abundant they are is measures of water quality or chemistry, because there's a number of species that are really sensitive to things like siltation or sedimentation or poor water chemistry, and they disappear when these sites become degraded. Now the next group, which is my favorite group, and are, are the salamanders. And these are found in low order streams as well, especially low order streams that don't have fish, because fish really like to eat salamanders. Um, so they're the dominant vertebrates in these low order streams. They can reach, just like the invertebrates, really exceptional population densities, a couple of individuals per meter square in these streams. And the major group of salamanders that we have in central Appalachia are the lungless salamanders. Okay, so these animals, as their name implies, they don't have lungs. They breathe entirely through their skin. And they're able to get the oxygen they need because they hang out in these streams that have uh, water that's sometimes moving kind of fast, mixing with the air, and they can get all the water they need by just breathing through their skin. Um, the major groups of salamanders that we find in these streams are the dusky salamanders. So here's four species pictured right here, the Allegheny Mountain dusky, the Northern dusky, the seal salamander, and the Black Mountain. And in Kentucky, we find all four species sometimes in the same stream. If you move down to like North Carolina or South Carolina, you might have seven or eight different species in these streams. Another important group are the brook salamanders, like the Blue Ridge two-line salamander here. Now, what's real important about these animals is they need the stream to lay their eggs and that's where their larvae live. So I'll jump forward here for a second. And all salamanders that we have that live in streams in central Appalachia have a larval form and they, just like a frog has a tadpole, they remain in that form for several months, sometimes in the case of this species, several years, and then they undergo metamorphosis to the adult form. Now the larvae live in the streams and require the streams, but the adults live on the stream sides or sometimes in the forests. So they need to have both the streams and the riparian forests to be really abundant. Their roles are their major predators, especially macroinvertebrates, invertebrates and a food source for a lot of other species. You know, there's some salamanders that are major predators of other salamanders. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a spring salamander eating a dusky salamander. And in fact, he already had two dusky salamanders in his stomach when I took this picture. So they can, some consume other salamanders. So the next group I wanna talk about are the crayfish. So they're found in low and high order streams. Um, North America has the highest species richness of crayfish anywhere in the world with about 405 species and about 77% of those species are found in the southeastern United States and we have about 80 in Appalachia. Okay, so they're omnivores crayfish eat about anything they'll eat dead and decaying plant matter uh, fungi other animals and a lot of other animals eat them up to 240 species of wild animals in North America eat crayfish. So a lot of things eat crayfish. In central um, Appalachia, we have some really unique species. This is the grandfather mountain crayfish. It was first described in 2005 and it's endemic, meaning this is the only place in the world where it's found endemic to the mainstream of Linville River upstream from Linville Falls. Now, other ecological roles that crayfish play are that they are burrowers, okay? So probably some of you see these little crayfish mounds that they form on land, and that leads down to a series of tunnels. And some spend all their life in the tunnels, some only tunnel some of the time and spend a lot of time in aquatic environments. But the important thing about these tunnels is they create habitats for lots of other animals. So amphibians, reptiles, some fish, some invertebrates require these tunnels to lay their eggs in and to undergo their life cycle. So crayfish create habitats for lots of other animals. Now, the next group that I want to talk about that's super diverse in central Appalachia, especially in the higher order streams, are the freshwater mussels. 
And most of our muscles um, in this, this area are in the family Unionidae. And all of them are benthic. That means they kind of hang out on the stream and river bottoms and they're filter feeders. They eat things like phytoplankton and zooplankton and, and microbes and fungi that are floating around in the water column. So some people call uh, freshwater mussels like natural filters that can uh, allow for cleaner and clearer water. The thing about a lot of mussel species is that many are disappearing. And some are disappearing for reasons associated with like land use change, increased sediment levels within streams. Some are disappearing because of activities associated with dams, um, but some are disappearing and we have no idea uh, why. Um, when it comes to central Appalachia, you know, there are, there's just a few that we would consider like only found in the Appalachian Mountains. And an example of that would be the Ac Appalachian Elk Toe, which is pictured here. But many of the major rivers that drain the central Appalachians have really high species richness. The Cumberland River system has 89 different species of freshwater mussels. The Tennessee River system has 104. And at just small spots within some of these river systems, like the Clinch River, the Tennessee River system, you can find 51 different mussel species at a single location. Now, mussels are really pretty. They exhibit all kinds of different shapes and patterns. Each one of these is a different species here, and they can be really big or sometimes really small. This shows the max and minimum size for North American mussels with a giant floater, which obviously is a giant one there. And then the Alabama moccasin shell, which is much smaller. Now, the final group I wanna mention here um, are the fish. And there's about 400 species in central Appalachia. Um, if we look at just small sections of it, like the Blue Ridge, you know, there's about 90 species. And generally with fish, we tend to find more species in these higher order streams. So like fourth or fifth or sixth order streams have more species. Although there's numerous what we would consider like headwater specialists only found in these low order streams. And good examples of headwater specialists are the darters, like the red line darter here where the males exhibit these really colorful patterns during the breeding season. Um, and we see a lot of um, species that are endemic to the central Appalachians. That means they're found nowhere else um, in the world. A good example of that is what we call the Kentucky arrow darter, which is restricted to only six counties in southeastern Kentucky. And we only know of it occurring in about 47 localities. Um, these guys inhabit uh, riffles, they eat mostly mayflies, um, some other invertebrates, small crayfish, and this species has been recently listed as federally threatened due to changes in its habitat. So it's sensitive to siltation because that affects um, its invertebrate prey, and it's also sensitive to changes in water quality and chemistry. So there's lots of other really interesting central Appalachian species. You know, it is home to North America's largest salamander, the hellbender. And in fact, it's like the stronghold for this animal. They seem to be doing really well in some places of central Appalachia and elsewhere they're not doing as well. It's home to many reptile species like the crayfish specialists, the queen snake. And of course, many of the large fish species like long nose gar, and we have things like large and smallmouth bass as well. So um, there, there's, there's different levels of biodiversity all across these streams with lots of different species. So how do the central Appalachians compare to other regions? So let's first look at salamanders. We're only looking at one salamander family here, the lungless salamander family. And what this map shows is that the darker areas have higher species richness, so more species than the lighter areas. And we can see Central Appalachia has really more species than anywhere else in the world, besides maybe a few places in Central America, but really high species richness. We have about 55 to 65, probably a few more, depending on how we define Central Appalachia species, which represents about 10% of all salamander species um, in the world. And we have at least 14 endemic species. Um, a good example of an endemic species in central Appalachia is the West Virginia spring salamander, which is only found in one county, Greenbrier County in, in, uh, in West Virginia. 
Yeah, we can say the same thing when it comes to comparing diversity with these other groups. Crayfish biodiversity, again, centered in the Southeast, um, but we see really high levels of species richness in central Appalachia. And really, you know, what's interesting about crayfish is we're the global hotspot for crayfish in the Southeast. There's no other place around the world that compares. Um, this map's a little different. This is for freshwater mussels, but we see some of the states in central Appalachia, like Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, even northern Georgia, depending how we're, we're call, calling central Appalachia, has really high species richness, you know, over 100 different species, 174 in some of these sites. So we can see that when we compare biodiversity, you know, from central Appalachia to other regions, you know, it's really unparalleled. Now, the final thing I wanna talk about is just how these ecological interactions of these species and how they uh, promote biodiversity. For example, salamanders depend on a wide variety of invertebrates to eat for food. And a project that we have done in Kentucky is we looked at what these salamanders were eating. Um, and we caught 564 larval salamanders. We looked at what was in their stomachs and we did this non-lethally. We kind of pumped their stomachs full of water and they threw up whatever they're eating. But out of these 564 animals, we uh, found over a thousand aquatic invertebrates, 150 morpho species representing 40 families and orders. Um, they were eating stuff not only in the aquatic environment, so in the streams, but in the terrestrial environment as well, that probably fell into the stream. So 700 terrestrial invertebrate species, um, 122 morpho species from 41 families and orders. Now, what's interesting about this is not just that they're eating all these invertebrates, but as water quality changed, these salamanders had a lot less to eat. So when we saw decreases in water quality, it led to decreases in invertebrates and decreases in the salamander body condition. And that's what we're showing here. And this is our measure of water quality here. It's called specific conductance. It measures the ionic strength of the water and sometimes is related to things like siltation and sedimentation. So we see that as water quality changes, these salamanders basically get a lot skinnier. And I don't have a graph for this, but we also found a lot fewer salamander species. As, these wa as water quality changed. You know, my final example is just has to do with freshwater mussels and they are fascinating animals and really exemplify these important ecological interactions. So how a freshwater mussel reproduces, it has like a little larval stage called a glochidia. And these glochidia are released into the environment and these glochidia have to parasitize fish in order to complete their life cycle and, and, uh, and form into juvenile muscles, which eventually turn into adult muscles. Now, freshwater muscles need to kind of attract these fish close to them because the muscles themselves can't move in order to release their glochidia for success. And they have all kinds of different ways to lure these, these fish in. And they use these extensions of their body tissue to create these lures. So this lure looks like a little, uh, maybe a darter or a minnow, and maybe a bass would come by and think that's a fish and grab onto it. And then that muscle would release its glochidia. This muscle is producing um, glochidia or, or lures that look like stream invertebrates, and this darter might find them enticing. And once they bite onto these lures, they release all these glochidia into the environment. These glochidia then um, adhere to the gill filaments of the fish. They insist there, undergo some changes before they drop off those gills and start their life living on the stream substrate. Now, what's interesting about this, this whole life cycle too is that many mussel species have only a few or one host fish species that they, lose, that they use to parasitize. They can't just use any fish, there's just a few species. So when we have declines in fish species, we, it may lead to declines in mussel species if their hosts are not around. So in summary, I just wanted to provide just a, a brief um, in, in information about biodiversity. These freshwater lodic systems in central um, Appalachia have a really diverse assemblage of species. Indeed, it is a global hotspot for biodiversity. You know, we often think of the 
tropical rainforests as global hotspots for biodiversity, and indeed they are, but for things like mussels and crayfish and even salamanders, there's no place else in the world um, that we find more species than in central Appalachia. Many of these groups are dependent on other groups for food, habitat, or to complete their life cycle. And I mentioned a little bit when it comes to conservation and that we've had some species disappear, decline. You know, we can, we can improve their habitats by making changes to the watersheds or riparian zones. And this can improve the, the stream conditions in which these animals live. So on that note, if there's time, I'll take some questions. Um, but that's, uh, that's all I got for you guys. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, that was a great presentation. I Every time I learn more about mussels, it just blows my mind. They're really interesting creatures. Um, we did have a question come into the chat box. And if anybody else is have a question for Stephen, um, please type it into the chat box and I'll read it out loud. Um, but one came in asking, how do beaver dams affect fish and mussel species diversity? What impacts are possible on the mussel species life cycle? Yeah, well, you know, beavers will come in there, they'll put in the dam, and you, what they're doing is basically creating pools in these in these stream systems. And so, you know, it, in some ways, it it enhances biodiversity because you have species that use pools that seem to do really well. Okay, but in other ways it kind of diminishes it like a beaver dam, you know, if it affects the fish assemblage, it could affect the muscles ability to reproduce. Um, oftentimes, you know, these beaver dams are created in these lower lower order streams as well that don't have like a, a lot of different mussel species so. Um, so I'm not aware of a lot of research that suggests that beaver dams themselves can limit mussels, but I could see in some cases, especially if it affects their host fish, it could have an impact. All right, thank you. We did have another question come in from Rick um, asking, how can we better control sedimentation in the central apps? Yeah, I think that some of the work we've done here at University of Kentucky, especially at University of Kentucky's Robinson Forest, is we've looked at streamside management zones. And basically this is um, keeping some tree and vegetation cover close to these, these streams that, and that prevents a lot of runoff because that runoff um, and sediment is captured in these management zones and then can um, prevent that silt and sediment from entering, entering the streams. You know, we also have to think about, you know, where we place roads and other things like that in proximity to these streams and, and how we use those roads at different times of seasons, you know. Great, and that's a great question and a great answer that ties into our third presentation that we have. So we might have more answers for you, Rick, um, when AJ talks. But does anyone else have any questions for Stephen? Just the obligatory awkward like 15 seconds of silence. <laughs> hey, I'm Great. used to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Stephen. Um, thank you so much. And up next, we have Anna also Brooke from Mountain True giving a presentation on the importance of good water quality. So, Anna, if you want to share your screen and I'll get you spotlighted. Thanks, Dakota. Let's see. Can y'all see that? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, thank you very much for having me. My name is Anna Alsobrook. I am the Watershed Outreach Coordinator with the French Broad River Keeper Program based out of Mountain True. We are an environmental nonprofit based um, in the Southern Appalachians, basically. Uh, and we take a look at environmental issues that the region of Western North Carolina and Northern Georgia face. Um, so we, we focus our efforts typically on resilient forests, clean waters, and healthy communities. I work in the French Broad River Keeper program. So my um, 
my work is uh, tied to our water quality work specifically. What do we do? So we're an environmental organization and we do a lot of boots on the ground type activities, lots of volunteer work days, uh, citizen science programs. We work on public forest planning. We do a lot in terms of water quality, like I mentioned. We advocate for sensible land use, promote clean energy, and then we also encourage civic engagement. So going into our water quality work, we have a ton of citizen science programs uh, across our region that look at water quality specifically. And I'll touch on a few of those today. Um, some of what we do involves specifically sediment and sediment influx into creeks and rivers. And that's our Muddy Water Watch program. Um, and, and so folks will go out, we'll, we'll train them beforehand and they'll go out and record and report any kind of illicit sediment discharges into creeks and rivers, um, mostly coming from poor construction practices or poor logging operations. Uh, and then we'll work with the appropriate entities to, to get those um, management practices fixed or whatever the case may be to get those things fixed. Um, we also do a lot of water quality monitoring around specifically E. coli bacteria in our watersheds. I, I don't know where everybody is, but the French Broad is a highly recreated river and its tributaries are also pretty highly recreated. Uh, so, so the public health, um, there is a public health component to what our water quality is and, and which way it's trending. And so every, every, season, every summer season from May to September, we take weekly E. coli samples and we publish those results to a website called the Swim Guide. And it's a very easy to understand format for public users. Um, it's kind of like a red light, green light system. If, that, if a particular site passes um, or if it surpasses the EPA threshold for E. coli, we'll mark it as a red. If it, if it is lower than the EPA threshold, we market green, which means it's safe to go swimming. Um, and the swim guide program is pretty, pretty interesting and pretty cool because it's international. Uh, so if you happen to have the app on your phone, you can, can just pull it up wherever you are and it should geolocate you to wherever the nearest sampled body of water is. So you can get the water quality data when you're on vacation. We also do a ton of microplastic sampling. This program is pretty, pretty new, but we've been trying to create a baseline of what we're seeing in freshwater systems in terms of microplastics. And, and microplastics are just, um, if folks don't know, they're the breakdown of, of plast all plastic, just breaks down. It doesn't biodegrade, it just breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. And we're starting to see those everywhere. Um, especially our, our surface waters. Um, some of our non-water quality related things, we, we do a lot of recreational access work um, and manage the French Broad River Paddle Trail, which has a bunch of campsites. We do adopt a stream and big litter and other litter cleanup type things, as well as a lot of educational workshops. We do a lot of river cleanups in the summer times, find some creepy baby dolls, lots of tires usually. Okay, so this is this is why we're here really. Um, like I mentioned, we do, a, we do a lot in terms of collecting water quality data in house, uh, but we also every other year we publish a report and it synthesizes data from us, as well as data from the state of North Carolina and data from another nonprofit that focuses on water quality um, in the area called EQI, Environmental Quality Institute. So what we do is we synthesize all of that and basically summarize a particular stream or reach of stream um, as a, a like a letter grade A through D. Um, and we have not yet formally published 
the 2021 report. It is, it's finished. It just hasn't hit press yet. Um, but what we're seeing is kind of a downward trend across the board, even in areas that are more typically forested, which is unfortunate. Uh, what we're attributing to, we are attributing this to a couple of different factors. One is um, our region is seeing phenomenal development growth right now. And all the impact from the pervious surfaces, you know, more cars on roads, um, less infiltration rates with the ground. All of that is, is really digging into our water quality here locally in the French Broad. And uh, I imagine that's pretty typical of most Southern Appalachian streams and rivers right now, especially with our steep slopes in, um, and in the, in the development in those areas. We're also seeing more frequent and intense rain events uh, in effect of climate change. And because of that, not only are you just bringing more pollutants into waterways and streams and creeks, but you're also kind of resuspending what's already in there. So whenever we grab a sample during a rain event, it's gonna have more pollutants because it's been resuspended in the water column. Um, a lot of times pollutants will kind of drop down to the um, sediment of the river bottom and they can hang out and live in there for a while. Um, but once the rain starts turning that up, we'll see increased levels of, of pollutants during rain events. Um, and I did want to mention, I forgot to mention this earlier, one set of data that we look at closely that Stephen kind of mentioned was macro invertebrate stuff. So we have citizen science program that goes and collects macro invertebrate data twice a year. Uh, it's at a particular larval stage of those insects and bugs. And um, it's, it's very interesting to read because certain bugs are more sensitive to pollution. So if you don't see a very high diversity of bug population in the creek that you're looking at, uh, and you're seeing only pollution tolerant bugs, you, you will recognize that something's going on with water quality. It doesn't tell you what's going on, but it's a good indicator of what could be happening in terms of just general water quality trends for that creek or stream. So this is also probably pretty typical for Southern Appalachian streams. Our, our two biggest pollutants, number one is sediment, and number two is bacteria. Um, the, the sediment typically comes from a couple different places. One is just eroding riverbanks and poor development practices. And it's, an, it's a pollutant. People are often like, why is there a pollutant? But it is a pollutant. Uh, it transports toxins into the river, it can increase the temperature of the water actually, which is not good for a lot of mountain, um, mountain area fish, and then it can smother aquatic habitats. Bacteria in, in the French Broad, we pretty regularly surpass EPA threshold for safe recreational waters for E. coli, um, which is a little bit unfortunate because as river recreation grows, it becomes a growing health, public health concern. So we're working on ways to figure out why we are passing it as often as we are, and then um, what, what that even really means. The good news is just because you jump into a river that has high E. coli doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get sick. Um, it is, you know, obviously can be attributed to a, a few different factors, but, um, you know, there's precautions you can make. The EPA threshold for E. coli is based on like submersion in the water. So if you're doing an activity where you're not getting your head or your nose or your mouth, the water's not getting in there, you can keep yourself pretty safe. Um, and then, you know, if you have an open wound, maybe you just take a shower afterwards using soap and wash that area pretty cleanly. What's interesting is there's a pretty strong correlation between turbidity or sediment in the river and bacteria or E. coli bacteria. So we're currently working with the 
North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality to create a, a real-time monitoring model to predict what E. coli levels may look like based on what turbidity levels currently are. And the reason we're doing that is because um, to test for bacteria takes at least 24 hours of 18 to 24 hours of incubation. So when you grab a sample and you want to test for bacteria, you're really just getting a snapshot in time. Um, anything could happen in that 24 hours after you grab that sample to change that number of or change that level of bacteria in the water. But testing for tur turbidity is uh, instant. So if we could build an, an algorithm or a model that can use turbidity as a proxy for E. coli, we can more correctly and more, um, more accurately kind of tell people what the public health concern is if, if that site is passing EPA levels or below EPA levels. So that's, that's interesting cutting edge work right now. Um, ways folks can be involved. We have a ton of, like I mentioned, ton of volunteer opportunities, especially around sampling for water quality. All, all these are based in um, Western North Carolina and Northern Georgia. So feel free to check our website to see some of our opportunities. I did list a few of our upcoming events that are specific towards improving water quality. Um, Stephen mentioned the repairing like riparian zones to keep sediment from coming into the river. Uh, that's called life. One way to do that is through live staking, which is to plant certain species of trees into river bank and those species will, their root systems will help hold that riverbank in place. It's a really cool process. You can only do it with certain species and um, you know, they, they're relatively fast growing. So when you plant some one year, you can come back two to three years later and harvest from those to plant in another place another year. So it's really cool, sustainable work um, and those, that healthy riparian zone actually does a lot in terms of filtering out toxins into the waterway as well. So that's why we focus a lot of our time trying to fix these um, riverbanks with low cost measures that will um, that are sustainable for the long run. On January 20, oh wait, that was, these already happened. So sorry about that. <laughs> I made this presentation a while ago, I guess, but we have more live staking days in the books um, coming up. And then there are more invasive removal work days coming up as well. Um, on tomorrow, we're doing a virtual screening of the story of plastic, which we can talk a little bit about where we'll talk about the plastics crisis, but also talk about our microplastic sampling and, thing, and what we're doing with that data. And then on the 29th, there's a winter tree ID hike. It's always good to get out and know um, what you're looking at. And in the winter, it's really hard to identify trees. So um, come out and learn how to do that with us. I think that's it for me. Yeah. So thanks for having me. I know that it was hyper specific to the French Broad and Mountain Tree work, but um, I think a lot of it is kind of relatable to other watersheds. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Anna, for that presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to type into the chat box and I can ask of our speaker? We have a question from Rick. He asked, do you plant on those steep banks or use cuttings there? So I think you had a picture of someone doing some live staking. Yeah, those, uh, I don't, I wasn't there that day. I don't know if they planted that specific bank or not, but you can plant live stake cuttings in um, eroded, eroded riverbanks to help stabilize them. Nice. I think several years ago, I helped y'all out on a volunteer day doing that. It was a cold winter day in a canoe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true, too. You can only do it during the winter when the plants are dormant. So it is 
cold work. Yeah, but worth it. <laughs> um, another live staking question. What's the survival survival rate? That's, that's a great question too. Um, the literature shows anywhere between 30 to 50%. We have seen a lot of success in some of the places we've done it on the French broad, upwards of like 80% survival rate. Um, that being said, as the trees get bigger, they start competing for each other for uh, resources. And so, you know, over the long term, I, I don't know what the what the end survival ability will be, but the root system is really what we are going after. Um, so establishing any kind of root is, is good. So, uh, you know, the more you can put in an area, the better within a reason. Usually you, you plant them two to three feet apart from each other. Great. And Jordan asked a question, um, what are some of the most prevalent invasive and nuisance species in your watershed? So in the French Broad River watershed. Yeah, we have a lot. We see a lot of Japanese knotweed along our riverbanks. Um, a lot of privet, I imagine the same as a lot of you probably see uh, where you are, but I, I guess probably Japanese knotweed is the most alarming and pervasive one we see across across the watershed. Yeah. All right, any other questions for Anna? Okay, we do have one. So in areas where E. coli levels are above recommended levels, has going back upstream to nearby tributaries to dial in the source been proposed? Yeah, I did not touch on that at all, but that, that's a great question. We do a ton of that work um, and that's not as much volunteer oriented. We do that as staff members. So when we start to see downward trends in terms of E. coli in, the, in a waterway, we'll go upstream, we'll walk creeks and rivers to try to pinpoint from where we think the source of E. coli is coming. And we've had a lot of success with that finding leaky sewer leaks. We found a few stray pipes um, and some old septic systems and some bad agricultural practices. So yeah, we've had, we've had some good success with that. It is a lot of time and a lot of um, thorns to the face. Uh, and it's, it's pretty slow moving to really pinpoint it. Sometimes, you know, it is kind of a smoking gun. You can see specifically, oh, there's a sewer line that's leaking sewer into the river, but it's not always that cut and dry. So we have some head scratching areas that we kind of continuously monitor to just um, better figure out what, what may be going in from where. That's a great question. Yeah, and thank you everyone for these questions. Um, and if you have more, we do have a little bit of extra time it looks like. So at the end of all of our speakers, if you have more questions to ask of any of them, please feel free to just ask them. Um, but if there are any other questions for Anna, I'll do again the obligatory awkward silence of like five or six seconds. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Anna. And up next, our next speaker is AJ Lang with the North Carolina Forest Service. He's gonna talk about mitigating threats to water quality during forestry operations specifically. Um, and I do wanna say just quickly, it was brought to my attention that um, in registration, we did not ask for your registered forester numbers. So I will actually need, I'm gonna send out a Google form to get those so you can get your CFEs if you need them and want them. So stay tuned for that link. Um, it'll be at the end of AJ's presentation. But AJ, handing it to you. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Forestry best management practices protect watersheds. You know, we work off the premise that healthy forests provide the cleanest, most stable surface waters and groundwater recharge among all land uses. And I think Anna's presentation highlights that. You know, there is no mention of forestry practices um, 
harming water quality in her presentation, which is uh, good, good to hear. We know that we can manage forests uh, to create healthy conditions, and that's going to minimize the effects uh, to water quality themselves. And what's really phenomenal, I would say, about forestry and, and best management practices is that we have well over 100 years of, of research where we've been examining what, if, what happens after we cut trees and what are some ways that we can uh, keep water quality at its best. So research, you know, 100 years ago when we didn't have the best of practices, it began with recognizing that we had a problem. We've evolved into understanding these, these issues associated with silviculture. And then what I like to think of as today, we've evolved into a, into a state where we've provided continuous development and implementation of forestry BMPs to protect water quality. So I wanted to quickly start out with, you know, I guess some background information here. First off, what is a forest operation? And there's several publications that go into detail about this, but it's any activity that enhances forest growth and or recovers harvest yields. And these can include activities such as site preparation, planting, thinning, fertilizing, timber harvesting, and road construction and maintenance. And collectively, these are essential to the practice of forestry. And another way to look at it and what I tell, tell students when I teach at NC State is that forced operations are how we make silviculture happen. Silviculture is implying that there will be trees afterwards. It is not gonna be converted from forests to some other land use. We're gonna to continue to grow trees. But we've recognized over the years that there is a potential for water pollutants associated with forestry. In the Clean Water Act, they classify the pollutants that we've been describing today as non-point source. We know that these non-point source pollutants occur naturally in our streams, so there is a background level of things that are being contributed to our streams. But where we come into issue is, is where we begin to accelerate it. And I meant to say that the, the natural background is highly dependent upon the geology of the area. Uh, but we can we can come into tr into trouble when we conduct forest management operations poorly, and we accelerate the rate in which sediment is is dirt is moving across the landscape. So sediment is the number one pollutant. I think we heard that a couple of times. But there are also other nutrients, uh, chemicals, thermals, biologicals, and organics that can be considered a pollutant. So forestry best management practices are designed to prevent or minimize water, water pollution. And in general statute, we have uh, a definition of forestry BMPs as being effective and practicable methods to, produce, to prevent or reduce non-point source pollution to a level that's compatible with water quality goals. And as I mentioned earlier, we started kind of in this lower right part of the uh, the diagram here to the right, where you know, 100 years ago we were we were beginning to evaluate effectiveness of our practices on the landscape. From there, we developed BMPs, and then we had this great thing called the Clean Water Act that passed in 1972, and it kind of institutionalized the development of best management practices at the state level. So today, we we are doing all four of these. Uh, activities simultaneously. Each state has their own specific forestry BMP manual, which uh, we provide to our forestry stakeholders across the Southeast. In North Carolina, forestry BMPs are what we, what we call voluntary. So they're not a mandatory practice. They're recommendations for how we might comply with water quality standards in a forestry setting. In North Carolina, we have a thing called forest practice guidelines related to water quality. Those are standards in which all forest operations must meet in order to be remain exempt from having to get permits for, from the Sediment Pollution Control Act, uh, the North Carolina's Sediment Pollution Control Act. It doesn't give us a entitlement to pollute waters, 
it just removes some of the permitting processes that are required of other businesses such as land clearing and and uh, development and such. So more about BMPs. Uh, this can be a little bit of a confusing topic. We it's it's this uh, kind of this idea out there, right? Well, so let's let's try and uh, let's try and nail it down here. It it can be a tangible thing. It can be what we can do, such as leaving uh, what Dr. Price had talked about, streamside management zones. Uh, it could be implementing a bridge mat across a stream when we have to cross a stream, or it could be different. Uh, practices that we use to control um, control runoff and capture sediment, such as implementing a silt fence or putting gravel on roads, seed and straw, you name it. Uh, but BMPs are not only a thing what we do, they are a process of how we do it as well. It can be, and what I'm talking about there is, you know, when do you conduct a, a forest operation? What does the timing look like? What equipment suite do you select from in order to conduct that operation? Did you lay out the roads? Uh, how many decks do you use? Et cetera, et cetera. So it's not only what we do, it's how we do it as well. North Carolina's BMPs primarily focus on access or a lot of BMPs, at least for erosion and sediment control, focus on, on our access systems, so roads, decks, skid trails, stream crossings, where we're going to put a heavy piece of equipment um, requires uh, forest floor disturbance. And we know that the forest floor is able to attenuate and, and process water much slower, and it makes its way into the stream. When we put a machine on, on the landscape, we've got to compact that area, and that leads it to more opportunity for erosion to, to make its way to the stream. So there are a number of BMPs that focus on this area. But we've also got plenty of BMPs in other areas as well, uh, probably the most important of which is planning there. But there are others, as you see, listed here on the, on the slide. Part of the reason why we want BMPs to be a voluntary measure is because BMP selection varies tremendously based on the site in which you're conducting the operation in. You know, the picture on the left, we're looking in Graham County. We've got topography, obviously, versus the picture on the right in Pender County of North Carolina. Uh, BMPs look vastly different, uh, and it can be based on terrain. Uh, we may be implementing BMPs based on land use history, soils, the operation type that's applicable, costs associated that the, uh, the landowners are willing and able to incur. It may also vary dependent upon the landowner's objectives as well. So in the advertisement of this, uh, of this talk, I, I was asked to talk about ways to reduce water quality impacts on forestry operations. And in my mind, that immediately takes me to, well, you got to start with a plan. Uh, before you even start with the plan, it's a good BMP, a how-to BMP, to review what regulations might apply to the tract in which you're trying to manage. Uh, one good tool that is, is available, freely available, is North Carolina's forestry pre-harvest planning tool. It can help you with some of these regulations. It can help you with planning the site and, and selecting BMPs and recognizing where maybe areas you, you might wanna focus on. And of course, always visiting the site and, and ground truthing all this information is, is critical as well. But if you're a landowner and you want to start with a plan, you know, re request special emphasis and ask questions about the water resources that exist on your track. You know, identify the streams, the other wetlands and water bodies, and how we might go about protecting them with streamside management zones. Consider where you are in the landscape. You know, in Appalachian, we've got uh, you can be at the top of the mountain, and then BMPs will look different up there than they do at the bottom. Uh, bottom of the slope near the stream. Um, you know, scrutinize a lot of these. We've been doing forestry and we've been practicing tree cutting uh, for a long time. And with that, we inherit a lot of the road systems and their 
there's certainly, um, they weren't installed, these initial road systems weren't installed uh, before BMP. So a recommendation would be to scrutinize the access system that you have and identify areas where you might be able to better control runoff and capture sediment. And of course, there may be incentive programs in your area as well, and that's a, a great way. The North Carolina Forest Service is a great uh, first stop in order to start that conversation and get you pointed in the right direction when you're going to manage your, manage your land. Consulting with resource professionals. Ask questions about your plan, seek input, and revise the plan accordingly. Use a written contract and make sure that the, the plan and the contract meet your objectives, and then implement that plan according, according to how you, um, how you have it written up in your plan and contract, and then monitor and maintain those results to ensure that we're protecting water quality, visible uh, issues that might lead to, to sedimentation. So one of the things that we do at the state is we do a, a comprehensive statewide survey of BMPs. And what we've done is we've formulated questions from the 395 questions um, or 395 actionable BMPs within our BMP manual. And we put them into questions where we can answer uh, a series of yes, no questions. And we're asking whether the BMP was applicable, first off, and if it is, is it properly implemented? And then secondly, is it a risk to water quality? And the most recent comprehensive survey that we've done was um, between 2012 and 2016, where we looked at 204 sites and we got a BMP implementation rate of 84%. I won't go into detail in that, into that exact, all the different nuances of that survey, but you can check it out at that link there. But I will also note that less than 5% of those 28,000 observations that we had across uh, 204 sites, uh, less than 5% of those BMPs were associated with any kind of water quality risk, visible water quality risk, that is. So I also wanted to talk about streamside management zones um, because they're critical for protecting water quality as well. The way that I look at them is it, they're the last line of defense in terms of controlling sediment from reaching the stream. If we're applying BMPs across the entire site, uh, erosion control measures, perhaps a narrower SMZ might be uh, adequate to protect that water quality. Uh, but of course, there are also ecological and vegetative considerations uh, that are important for the aquatic life, uh, shade and woody debris and the habitat that these streams create and that the vegetation uh, plays a role in as well. So hopping back to that survey that I just mentioned, I wanted to show you this graph that we created using the data from that, that implementation survey. We looked at about 570 uh, segments of streamside management zones on logging jobs that were less than six months old. And we asked that question, is it risk water quality? Yes, no. And that's what's depicted on the left-hand side there. We've created what we call a, a logistic regression model where we regress it against the streamside management zone width. And what you can, what I want you to get out of this, out of this, uh, this figure is that as the width increased, we saw the, the probability of a risk to water quality decreases, right? And if we look more towards the, the 50 foot area, we can, we start to see these numbers or these lines converge. So therein lies the reason, uh, part of the reason why we, re if, if someone asked me blindly, what, how wide should your SMZ be? My recommendation is likely to be 50 feet, 50 feet in order to, to protect water quality, because that's what, what we observed with our most recent data set. Another way that you can protect stream or streams are, are through selecting stream crossings appropriately. Uh, first off, we, we do a number of logger training programs. We, we emphasize, is it necessary? Do you have to cross the stream? 
If so, is there where is the best location within the track that you could possibly cross it? Next is, can it be temporary? Can we remove that and stabilize the ground and let the uh, let the area revegetate and restabilize naturally? And then next, you know, selecting a crossing based on the characteristics that are given to you there. You know, is it really steep slopes coming into it, or is it really um, really shallow and, and gentle slopes coming into the stream uh, with the idea that we're trying to maintain to the best of our ability maintain the natural channel dimensions all right so what's being done to promote best management practices i'll start with at the state at the state level we work uh, you know, North Carolina Forest Service works with the, the 12 other southeastern states collaboratively to on different emerging forestry issues, policies and challenges. And we do that through an organization called the Southern Group of State Foresters. There's their website listed there. Check out our water section. So it, it, with this group, uh, you know, I'm I'm a representative for North Carolina. Um, talking about specifically water quality issues and water resource issues. And when we bounce ideas off of one another and, and create good outreach products as well. So I'll leave it at that. We also talk about training. Yeah, it, training is a key element in each of the Southeastern states forestry BMP pro programs, but it's not solely run by the state agency. It's, it's run by the universities, cooperative extension services, uh, industry, landowners. And a lot of these trainings are often tied to forest certification. So your FSI or SFI, FSC, tree farm, those types of certification programs. And our, logger, our training is, is oftentimes logger centric because they're in key operational control, they're a target audience, uh, and they're easier to reach. Industry supports this because it's not only, we're not solely focusing on, on best management practices. We're also talking about uh, smart business decisions as well as safety. And we kind of pile all that together and, and create a more comprehensive program to, to train loggers to implement BMPs. Oftentimes states have, a, or they're a little bit different varying by states. I've got some of the, uh, the emblems there on the on the right hand side of the, the slide here, but there's there's a core workshop where it's two or three days of in the, in the class going through presentations explaining what why water quality is important and what BMPs are, and then there's a continuing an, annual uh, continuing education program where we need annual training, and a component of that will also talk about BMPs. So our data indicates that the use of BMPs improves when the logger has that formal training and the purchasing mill and the landowner participate in the different certification programs. Uh, and also when the landowner receives technical assistance or the logger is using some type of pre-harvest planning. Um, so over time, especially since the, the passage of the Clean Water Act, we've seen a trend an increased trend in BMP implementation, uh, but there's still opportunities that remain, of course. So very quickly, I wanted to talk about the BMP manual revision that we're trying to um, uh, put out this first quarter of 2022. And I wanted to draw specific attention to chapter two, which is the rules and regulations chapter. We added, uh, in the revision, we added a new section on threatened and endangered species. It doesn't have actionable BMPs within it, but it draws attention to the issue and it's educating our forest community, forestry community on these, on these conditions. It talks about 4D rules. If you don't know what that is, you're soon to find out. Uh, it also provides links to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who have, uh, who are the most knowledgeable about aquatic species. Uh, threatened and endangered. Uh, the good news is, is from my from our observations in our in our shop here, we we find that threatened and endangered species usually require clean water, low to no sedimentation, consistent 
water temperatures, swift flowing water without obstruction. And that's great because these, all of these attributes are already being achieved through the application of BMPs as we've had them recommended for a number of years now. And then lastly, uh, as, a, as a quick plug, you know, the last edition of the BMP manual was produced in, in 2006. So we're uh, well past time. We, we've spent a, a, a lot of effort in trying to communicate with the different stakeholders that might have influence on, on operations and got their input and, and included a lot of those edits in this revision. The, the manual itself has been shortened pretty substantially. We've edited, edited it for brevity. Uh, we've also included information for awareness on climate resiliency and, and the aquatic threatened and endangered species section. We've entirely rewritten the SMZ section for clarity as well as the wetland section. There's some additional erosion and sediment control measures that are added into the manual this, this round. Uh, we've reintroduced the, the rolling dip on roads and uh, rolled erosion control products, which we see more frequently on DOT roadside ditch projects, and just introducing that topic to loggers uh, out in the field. Uh, there are also new BMPs for shovel logging in the swamp. Uh, and and a, uh, uh, an appendix that is a, a, a bibliography of BMP research studies that I've put together that have been published since 2006, that hopefully has a starting off point uh, for researchers and, uh, or others looking for uh, trying to define how wide their SMZ should be and, and looking back at some of those studies. Um, so with that, I know I'm well over my time. Uh, I apologize for that. And um, I will point you to a couple of different websites here, mc4service.gov, check out our program and services, water quality, all the work that we do in the water resources branch of the Forest Service is, is nested within that section of our website. And then if you're more interested in regional type information, Southern Forest, org is a, is a good place to start. Check out the water section. With that, I'll, I'll stop. Thanks, AJ. And we're actually doing pretty good on time. We have some saved, um, which is good because we had a number of questions roll in. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll just start at the top. Um, and, it, and it might tie in with your BMP revision process and maybe talking about that a little bit more because the question was, um, how do you work with the loggers or road builders or developers to improve their practices? Um, this person is in West Virginia and he was saying they don't really have the agencies that are responsible for protecting water quality behind us. And so it sounds like um, he was also very happy about Mountain True and all the work Anna that you're doing. So AJ maybe talking about like stakeholder process and things like that might help answer that question. A lot. Our, our agency has offices across all of North Carolina. Every, every county has a Forest Service representative. And we put boots on the ground and interact with these logging operators um, from time to time. And, and when those opportunities arise to educate and the, the loggers asking questions, or if we're having, an, an, a, if we're having a water quality issue, then they will, they will receive um, uh, some education, I, I suppose, as to how to how to best uh, fix those issues. So I, I would say, I guess the way that we are um, interacting with logging operators is through our, our regular business. We our agency is tasked with inspecting logging jobs for compliance with forest practice guidelines. So through that interaction, we're, we're able to, to reach a lot of the loggers and, and provide them education. But there's also the, the, um, uh, the training program, the SFI and FSC programs that require loggers to go through, through training uh, in order to deliver, deliver certified wood to, to mills. Great, thanks AJ. And as other folks, if you have questions, um, please type them into the chat. But the next one, um, 
was asking about some clarification on like regulations. If BMPs are voluntary and they're seen as the best way to reduce water pollution, what other regulations are there like uh, systematically? For forestry, I mean, there are, there are the federal, this is a, this is a big question. Um, there, there are federal rules that we need to comply with, but the one that we're most concerned about with forestry are the forest practice guidelines, which would set forth the standard uh, that we need to comply with. Um, let, me, let me leave it at that. It, if we need some more clarification, let's, uh, let's talk offline. That sounds good. Um, next question is about SMZs. And does your SMZ with risk assessment use slope distance? And was the assessment constrained to a certain slope threshold or done for multiple slope classes? So the assessment, the BMP assessment that we did, is, um, yeah, we'd, we'd arrive at a logging job and identify that there, there are segments of SMZ on whatever uh, slope it was. Uh, so I guess to answer your question, it varied It varied by slope. Uh, we, we saw things from 0% slope to probably well over 60% slope and everything in between. And the, the distance, how we measured the distance is we'd take uh, several, what we thought were representative areas of the overall streamside management zone, and we used we used a tape measure in a lot of cases, and um, in some cases we used a, a range finder to to help us uh, get those measurements. It's it's slope distance, not horizontal distance. We weren't gonna we weren't gonna do trigonometry out in the field. So. Great, thanks. Uh, the next question is also about SMZs, and it's a great question because that's one I feel like I get asked a lot uh, as a forester. Is the recommended SMZ width 50 feet total or 50 feet on either side of the stream? 50 feet on both sides of the stream. So you start pulling your tape from the edge of the, the stream bank itself, 50 feet on one side and 50 feet on the other side. Great. All right, and the next question was, um, are there attempts to coordinate educational efforts to non-forestry groups? We often leave sufficient SMZs on forest harvest sites only to have the buffers cleared out for agricultural use. I'm sure soil and water uh, does try to have some educational outreach opportunities, but I'm not aware of one that's, uh, I guess, universal across the Southeast. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure of one either, but that I think is a great opportunity, a good idea. All right, and then we had another question, and I think you must have mentioned this at some point, but someone asked for clarification on what is climate resiliency? Well, in, in our stakeholder process uh, and getting comments, we wanted to include everything that everyone was throwing at us. And one of those things, climate resiliency, was that the latest research has suggested that you know, we're receiving more, uh, more frequent, intense rainstorms. So the idea there was to um, Basically, are we tail we need to tailor our BMPs. Uh, they work, but we may need to apply more of them in the future because of these more intense rainstorms that are generating runoff. And uh, I guess that that's probably not a great uh, great answer, but that's that's what I'm trying to get at is that the the intensity of of rainstorms is increasing. And at least in the last 30 years or so. And we're trying yeah. to address that. Yeah, so adapting to changing climate and changing weather factors 
um, within the BMPs and kind of seeing it before it comes. Sounds like what you're trying to say. Great, great. Um, cool, well, I am not seeing any other questions. It looks like a comment did come through um, from Aaron, just to make sure everyone is aware that West Virginia does have a logger training program for state forestry BMPs that is required through state legislation. Um, input into the training is provided by the state SFI implementation committee. All right, great. Thank you, Aaron, for that clarification. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any questions for any of our speakers today before we wrap it up? It looks like a little bit early and I'm gonna get that link to copy and paste. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. So I am putting a link into the chat box that is the Google form. So if you would like CFEs for today's event, um, it's pre-approved pre for one and a half. Um, so please fill that out so you can get those. Um, it really the information that we didn't get in registration was your registered forester number. Um, and I apologize for that. So we just need to make sure we have all of our I's dotted and T's crossed so you get those credits. Um, but I think with that, I just want to say thank you again so much to all three of our speakers. I think it was a great lineup and a great voices with different backgrounds, but all really with one common goal um, of just great forestry and keeping the central Appalachians beautiful and biodiverse and keeping working forests in healthy and good conditions. So thanks everybody for joining us today and hope to talk to you all soon.